If you have your Bible, grab your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 5. So last Sunday evening, I had the privilege to attend a prayer vigil in Glendale on behalf of Assyrians in northern Iraq, uh, the situations that you might have heard about with with ISIS, who are being uh, hated and persecuted and displaced and abducted and, 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 and even killed for their faith in Christ. And when our brother Ninos was invited to address the crowd, he chose to quote from John 15, verses 18 through 25, where it says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my words, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. I think that this was an appropriate text to share because it accurately reflects the situation across the world for those who are followers of Jesus. Those who follow Jesus are persecuted. And this persecution is not a new thing. It's been happening ever since Jesus himself was hated and persecuted, displaced, abducted, and killed. And this persecution will continue until the end of the world. It's not happening in full force here in the United States yet, but there are no guarantees that the same level of of persecution will not come to our area And if Jesus guarantees persecution for all those who are his, then we who are Christ followers here in America should have our theology of persecution fresh in our minds so that we are prepared for it when it comes. And to that end, God has ordained for us today to study and be affected by a truly uh, beautiful text on persecution from Acts chapter 5. I call it beautiful because of the effect that comes from out of the life of somebody who lives by its truths. God has an effect he wants to manifest in us by giving us over to persecution. Just like with Jesus, who is not given over to persecution in a blind or a meaningless manner— God intended for Jesus to be persecuted for the amazing purpose of saving all those who trust in him. So also our persecution is given by the hand of God himself, our loving father, who intends to use our obedience to him in suffering persecution to produce joy in us and to produce glory to God through us. So let's read together in Acts chapter 5 verses 12 through 42. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles, and put them in the public prison. 
But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now, when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who, who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor For the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Father, thank you for giving us your word. What a gift it is that we have your word in front of us, that we can see it and study it and learn from it and be changed by it. Father, we pray that you would change our hearts today from the, the study of your word, that as your word is preached, that you would give our hearts new eyes, new vision to see you. God, I pray that we would be like the apostles who were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name, rather than being enamored with the honor that they were receiving from the people. I pray that as we think about experiencing suffering, that we would do it with eyes toward you, and that we would do it with joy, that we would experience joy as the disciples did. We trust you for these things. Through the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So today I hope to persuade you from God's word that following God in spirit-fueled obedience lays the foundation for joy in suffering and that it will be everlastingly worth it.
First, following God in spirit fueled obedience. There are three ways that the apostles demonstrate their willingness to follow God in spirit fueled obedience. And there are these one, by preaching Jesus, two, by miracles and healings, and three, by civil disobedience. First, by preaching Jesus. I want you to see that the history of the early church is characterized by spirit-empowered preaching that proclaims the supremacy and the lordship of Jesus. So um, I'm going to be reading scriptures to you. If you want, you can flip back through Acts chapter 1 through 4 and and follow along with me. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses, uh, one, who, one who speaks what they've seen and heard. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And what were they speaking? Look in verse 11. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And a crowd gathers, and Peter preaches to them about the supremacy and the lordship of Jesus. He preaches, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they go to the temple. They heal the lame beggar. He's been, he's been unable to walk since he was born. He's 40 years old. They heal him. And when the people come to see what happened, they preach to them about the supremacy and the lordship of Jesus. What God foretold, this is verse 18, what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Acts chapter 4 the Sadducees and the temple guards to come and arrest them and put them in prison. And the next day they're called to appear before the Sanhedrin, the uh, council, the same council that they're, they're with in Acts chapter 5, our passage today, the council of 71 uh, elders, the leaders of Israel. And again, they preach the supremacy and the lordship of Jesus. Verse 10, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved." And the council charged them not to speak any more in the name of Jesus. But they don't plan on obeying them, and they pray together in verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. Acts 5, the Sadducees conspire to throw the apostles in prison, not just Peter and John this time, like in chapter 4, but all 12 of the apostles. Look with me in verse 17 of chapter 5. But the high priest rose up, And all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain and the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. 
So you can see throughout the entire book of Acts so far, the apostles highlight their response. Every time that there's a crowd that gathers, they preach about the supremacy and lordship of Jesus. Look in verse 29 of chapter 5. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So, in this, in this moment here in, in chapter 5, this, this is a uh, pretty stinging insult that Peter gives to them. He basically says, you killed Jesus, you don't have the Holy Spirit, and you're not obeying God. So, so it, it's, it's, it's a very serious accusation that he makes, and the, the, the um, Sanhedrin respond um, vehemently to it. They, they, when it says in verse 33, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So I show you those things from Acts chapters 1 through 5 to show you that the apostles' willingness to preach about the supremacy and lordship of Jesus in spite of imprisonment and opposition and threats of death is a key evidence of their following God in spirit-fueled obedience. And the second way that the apostles demonstrated following God in spirit-fueled obedience is by the miracles and the healings that they performed. I think this is so important for us to hear as a church today. Sometimes you might hear Christians set up a false dichotomy between miracles and healings and preaching Jesus. They might say things that, that sound to be spiritual on the, on the surface. They might say something like, you know, miracles, yeah, but the greatest miracle is when a soul gets saved. And so, I agree that that is true. It is the greatest miracle in all of creation when God saves a soul. That is miraculous beyond belief. That he can rescue a soul that is dead and bring it into life everlastingly, perfectly, justly through Jesus. But if that saying, if, if, if that saying is used in such a way that it uh, minimizes or degrades or downplays or eliminates the actual experience of signs and wonders and miracles and healings in the church, that is a false teaching. The, 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 the signs and wonders and healings that were going on in the church were in conjunction with the preaching of God's word. They were not opposed to it. They were not uh, in contradiction to each other. And so, I, just like I did with, with preaching, going back through and seeing how the preaching of God, God's word demonstrated their spirit-fueled obedience, I also want to show you uh, the same thing about the miracles and the healing. So starting in chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Listen to this. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. And then what happens? Peter preaches to them about Jesus. A big, long sermon about Jesus in conjunction with this miraculous sign. Chapter 3, the man lame from birth, 40 years old, miraculously healed. Verse 9, and all the people, this is chapter 3, verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him while he clung to Peter and John, all the people— utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And what happens? See verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. And he preaches to them about Jesus. 
chapter 4, see how the Sanhedrin respond when they're faced with what to do in light of the fact that the man was healed. Verse 16, what shall we do with these men? They're talking to each other. What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. Interesting. The man gets healed, and the Sanhedrin orders them not to speak, because the healing of the man and the speaking and preaching of the gospel go hand in hand. Chapter 4, verse 29. Listen to how they pray. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Grant them, grant them to speak your word with all boldness while you do those things. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. In our chapter today, chapter 5, we read in verse 12, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And listen to this. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So there's mass healings going on. All the towns from around Jerusalem are coming together. And we know that the apostles are preaching about the supremacy and the lordship of Jesus. It says that multitudes of believers, men and women, are coming to the Lord. And so let it never be said that there are some churches that are miracles and healing type churches, and there are some churches that are preach the word type churches. Any church that wants to follow God and spirit-fueled obedience must be a church that both preaches Jesus and one that performs miracles and healings. God is pleased to use both together, not in conflict or contradiction to each other, to bring about the salvation of multitudes, of men and women from every tongue and tribe and nation under heaven. We're so blessed to be a church that is characterized by the faithful, regular preaching of the supremacy and lordship of Jesus. But let us also be a church that is characterized by the faithful, regular experience of miracles and healings. The apostles' willingness to continue to perform miracles and healings in spite of threats and imprisonment and opposition is the second key evidence of their following God and spirit-fueled obedience. And the third way that the apostles demonstrated following God in spirit-filled obedience is by their civil disobedience. You can see it in chapter 4, verse 18. So they, the Sanhedrin, called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And you can see it in our passage today, chapter 5, verse 29, where Peter and the apostles say, we must obey God rather than men. When they answer the charge that they've disobeyed the command of the Sanhedrin, just the prior chapter, to not preach anymore in the name of Jesus. You can see it in verse 42, where even after they were beaten, and commanded to quit preaching the good news, Luke says, as he's writing the book of Acts, and every day, every day, in the temple, and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is the, uh, that the Christ is Jesus. <laughs> I find it so interesting that this is in- included here in multiple places. Um, it seems Uh, at first glance, to be a contradiction to what's stated in Romans chapter 13, where it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. 
But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. So, the, the, the apostles are in this situation where they've been preaching. The Sanhedrin says, you may not preach. They threaten them. They say, don't do it anymore. This chapter, they beat them. They throw them in jail. And yet, they still are willing to do this. Why? There's a, there's a couple of reasons that I can think of why they would be willing to still preach, even though they were charged by the authorities to not do it anymore. Uh, one is uh, the angel. That would be cool if you could have uh, an angel that says, hey, I know you're told not to do this, but actually do this. Uh, <laughs> that'd be convenient for, for all the moments where um, you feel like you're being told to do something that's, that's not right. If you could have an angelic messenger um, encourage you to go ahead and do that thing. So that was one reason and why I think they, they received boldness to do it, because they had this, this um, experience of, of the angel telling them to. And then also, I think that they were thinking back to Jesus in the Great Commission. Um, just only several months prior, Jesus is saying to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the end of the age. So I think that they have this in their minds and they're empowered to do it by the Holy Spirit that came upon them in chapter 2. So, so they have this, th- these reasons why they're willing to disobey um, the authority. And I think that that's what this principle of civil disobedience or, or devotion to the truth really is. It's this idea that Although there is this law, this rule that says that you must do something that you think is wrong, or you may not do something that you know is right, that there is a higher law above that that says otherwise. And so you're obligated to obey the higher law, even though this, um, this lower authority is telling you differently. So there's this tension between submitting to the established authorities that have been appointed by God, and yet not submitting to those same authorities when they require you to disobey God. In Uh, uh, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, he writes, One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that, quote, an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. And then he goes on to talk about one who, um, by reason of conscience, feels like they should break a certain law that is unjust. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. And I agree with um, Martin Luther King's Junior's assessment, and that this is precisely what the apostles were doing when they openly, boldly defied the counsel of 71 elders of Israel, the leaders of the nation, by disobeying their rule and authority. They were, in fact, expressing the highest respect for God's ultimate rule and authority. And so, when, when we talk about this, this subject, um, it's I went back and forth for a long time <laughs> about which, which topics to share as examples in this context. And so um, I want to start by saying that, that as a matter of conscience, one's own 
experience of relating to God, that you might have a brother or sister in the Lord that disagrees with you about what the correct application of this principle is. So certainly we can see in the text that there is such a thing as people disobeying civil authorities to obey a higher authority. That concept is clearly taught. And now, when it comes to the application, there could be disagreement. So I'd advise you and encourage you to have charity with your brothers and sisters in the Lord who disagree with you on exactly how this principle should be applied. Uh, And the first one that I was going to talk about was uh, immigration law, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, If you'd like to talk to me about that afterward, I'd love to talk with you. Um, One example that I think is is maybe more clear is... uh, conscientious objection. So it's kind of a a civil disobedience that occurs within a military context. Um, There is a history in the United States of um, conscientious objection. People who say, I will choose to not fight in this war because I feel that it is for an unjust cause. There is immorality in the doing of the war, and so I will not participate. Um, Think about the German soldiers in World War II under, under Hitler's rule. They will not be excused before God because they said, I was just doing what my commanding officer told me to, No, those are situations where they should have defied the civil authority and expected then to receive death for choosing to not obey men, but rather to obey God. And they would have had a great reward (laughs) because of that. Um, So there is this uh, principle of disobeying governmental authority for a higher purpose, to obey God. Um, John Piper gives a great example in the idea of closed countries as we think about missions work into countries that are um, closed to the gospel. He says in the book Future Grace, in regard to spreading the gospel today, we talk so much about closed countries that we have almost lost God's perspective on missions as though he ever meant it to be safe. There are no closed countries to those who assume that persecution, imprisonment, and death are the likely results of spreading the gospel. And Jesus said plainly that these are likely results. Quote, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Matthew 24, 9. This is still um, Piper. Until we recover God's perspective on suffering and the spread of the gospel, we will not rejoice in the triumphs of future grace that he plans for the church and for the world. Another situation could be with your employer. If your employer is asking you to do something that could be uh, lying financially, like uh, evading taxes, you know, writing up your books in such a way that you avoid certain taxes or penalties. Uh, Another common one that I could think of is uh, the, the idea that, you know, I can't preach the gospel at my job. And I think that that could be true if, you're, if, if the ultimate reality is, and I will be fired if I, if I preach the gospel at my job. Th- that is a likely outcome. <laughs> that, that you could be, if your employer says, you may not speak about Jesus, and you speak about Jesus anyway, that you could be fired. And I I'm, want to submit to you today that this could be an example of a, a civil disobedience toward that employer authority for the higher authority of obeying God and doing what he is calling you to do and preaching the gospel to all nations. At home, um, just earlier in chapter 5, Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira uh, lying about money together, Ananias goes to his wife. Hey, sweetie, I have this idea. We're going to sell this property and we're going to say we sold it for this much, but actually we sold it for this much, and we're not going to tell them about all the profit we made on it, but we're going to look good in doing it, and so we're going to give it to the, to the apostles like that. And they collude together. Um, Sapphira following her husband's authority and saying, this is what we're going to do, and it was disastrous for them. Not only did he fall down dead at this moment, but she did as well. Uh, it would have been better for her to disobey her husband in that moment for the higher goal of following God. And as I was preparing this, I just, I just had this really strong sense that maybe there are women here today, or maybe this is for women who watch later online, who are married, whose husbands are asking them to either participate in or to cover up uh, immorality, wrongdoing that their husbands are perpetrating— <laughs> 
And I believe that God wants to free you from the burden of submitting to that unjust authority to release you to obey the higher calling of God rather than men in this moment. To believe that obeying God will be worth it for the, for the, for the um, temporal consequence of disobeying the more uh, human-level authority. So how can you be free to follow God when you know that your following him will result in bad consequences for you? Maybe you're like the disciples. You've been threatened and uh, imprisoned. You feel trapped by this unjust authority that's lording it over and you, and you don't see a way out. How can you obey God who seems to be far off when the authority figure is right in your face? And the reason that you can be released from the burden of stifling and unrighteous authority is because radical obedience to God fueled by the limitless power of the Holy Spirit lays the foundation for joy in suffering. Your willingness to do what God has required of you, your willingness to follow him and to follow him alone is what God will use as the foundation of your joy in him. And even if and even when they carry through with their threats and beat you and take away your freedom or take away your livelihood or proclaim that you're not a Christian or shun you or treat you with contempt, that in all those things that God will give you joy. And that brings us to point two, that, that um, our following God in spirit-fueled obedience lays the foundation for joy and suffering. Look with me in verse 40 of chapter 5. And when they had called the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. It's amazing that they left the situation threatened, imprisoned, beaten. They leave with joy, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to experience this. And if you can, uh, put yourself in, in this situation or imagine another situation in your, in your own life where you're experiencing persecution. And it is hard to think about how can I respond in such a way. Uh, also, think back to the unjust suffering of Jesus. The, the apostles weren't just acting on their own. They had a model that they were following when they were acting this way. They were imitating what they had seen in Christ, how he responded to unjust suffering. Think of Jesus when the religious authorities mocked his mom for being immoral before she was married, even though she was a virgin, when they called him a drunkard, even though he had never been drunk in his life, when they charged him with blasphemy, even though the name of Jesus is the name above every name, when he was beaten and flogged as a criminal, even though he did not commit any wrong, when he was crucified, even though he had done nothing deserving of death, and all this Peter the Apostle says in the book of 1 Peter, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So the Apostle saw this gracious response to unjust suffering— and they exemplified it in their own lives in the way that they left the presence of the council rejoicing. Peter himself speaks of this in chapter 4, uh, verses 12 through 19 of his first epistle, where he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator 
while doing good. So just like it says in that passage there, I think it's so important to keep in your mind the role that God plays in judging justly. We believe that God is the judge of all the earth, that no action, no motive, no intention escapes God's notice. He sees all, and he will accurately and rightly and truly judge all of it. And that knowledge, that realization that God will be the one who judges, is what can free us from, from feeling like I'm suffering and I need to get back at this other person, or they need to experience pain like I'm experiencing pain. Um, it can free us to be able to experience joy and suffering. And it's a battle to maintain a vision of God's supremacy and just judgment. Our natural inclination is to let our attitude of dependence and entrusting ourselves to God to uh, weaken. And what ends up happening is that we adopt this attitude that poisons our ability to experience joy and suffering. And I want to offer just a few of them to you today to see if any resonate with you for reasons why you might not be experiencing joy in your suffering. You might think, I know that I should be experiencing joy in my suffering as I think about these truths, but I, but I don't experience joy and suffering. Why is that? These are just possible reasons. I'm not saying that this is everybody's case. One possible reason that you're not experiencing the joy and suffering like you think you ought to be, is because of pride. You might think, if I were God, <laughs> that's where you know you're, you're, you're going wrong <laughs> to start. If I were God, I would not have sit- arranged the situation this way. Uh, some examples could be uh, your kids or you being sick, uh, your kids' bad attitudes, your experience of poverty, of not having enough material um, possessions. You might take these situations and say, if I were God, it would not be this way. It would be different. I would change it. This would not be the situation that I'd put myself in right now. And that could be one reason why you're not experiencing joy in it. Another possible reason is fear of man, like Dale mentioned earlier. If you have this attitude of, I'm more concerned with what others think of me than what God thinks of me. And some examples that I thought of were um, covetousness. If, if somebody else has something that you feel like you should have and you want that thing, and you're afraid of what other people would think of you because you don't have this thing, that can rob you of joy in the suffering of not having that thing. Another way is comparison of kids. Uh, You might think about your own family and about how your own kids act, and you might think to yourself, (laughs) I'm suffering at the hands of my kids. Other people's kids are better than mine. Why is it this way? And I think if you, if you have that, um, and, and, and not only why is it this way, what will other people think of me as they see my bad kids <laughs> that are disobeying and, and not listening to me? Um, that fear of man can rob you of joy in the suffering of having kids that are challenging and disobedient. If you can identify with one of these underlying attitudes that's preventing you from experiencing joy in the midst of your suffering, uh, there's a remedy that Peter offers in Acts 5 verse 30, where he says, The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So those sins, pride, fear of man, uh, another might be uh, self-pity, are sins that Jesus paid with, with his own blood when he was crucified. They were not his to bear, but he bore them for you. So you can experience forgiveness today and every day for those sins as you confess them to Jesus and receive the gracious gift of reconciliation with God. He wants you to have the joy of having your sins forgiven and having right standing with God. He wants to transform your experience of suffering from jaded to joyful. He wants to 
powerfully work in you to transform your heart and your mind into a new way of thinking, not like the old way that's bitter and self-justifying and angry and resentful at your suffering, but into the new and living way of embracing your suffering as a gracious gift from God, from God's hand, as it says in Philippians 1, for it has been granted or graciously given to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. So church, you can believe today that following God in spirit-fueled obedience will lay the foundation for joy and that it will be everlastingly worth it. It will be everlastingly worth it to follow God in this way. There is a confidence that the disciples had and that you and I can have in being willing to obey God in the face of unjust suffering. Right as things were getting at their worst, when the council is so enraged at the apostles that they want to kill them, take a look at Gamaliel's response starting in verse 34. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. And it's so ironic that he would say this because, of course, it is absolutely true that they were opposing God. They were in direct opposition to the plan that God had established from eternity past. Think in Ephesians. Um, God has predestined us from before time began to be chosen and adopted in Christ. And in, 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 in the Old Testament, we see the story of the nation of Israel through, through Abraham. God is gathering together a people for his own possession. And, and this is culminating in Jesus and then in Peter in Matthew sixteen eighteen, where Jesus says to Peter, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So because this is it, Peter, interesting, that, that the one who's being accused in this moment, the one who's the spokesperson for the, the disciples, Jesus is specifically encouraging him, you are Peter, and on this rock, on, on you, beginning on you, I will build the church. And there is nothing that can prevail against it. Because the church is from God, it will stand. We don't have to fear the church being snuffed out or yourself being snuffed out because the church, God's purpose, will endure everlastingly. So there's going to be a day in which there is a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's going to be a day when persecution will be no more and God will wipe every tear away from our eyes. And when, when, when you follow God in obedience by preaching the gospel, by showing forth the power of the Holy Spirit, in miracles and healings, when you refuse to obey the civil authorities' unjust and immoral laws, you will lay for yourself a foundation of experiencing great joy in the midst of suffering unjust persecution for the name of Christ. God is the sovereign Lord and judge over all creation, and as we entrust ourselves to our faithful creator while continuing to do good, we will find that we are heirs to a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and God will receive great glory from our lives. And to close, I think that Jesus said it best when he said in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a stand and it gives light in all the house. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Father, we pray that we would have this attitude of Jesus that, he, that Jesus speaks of in, in Matthew 5, an attitude of being blessed for persecution and not hiding our light under a bowl or being like salt that is no longer salty and is no longer good for anything, but give us boldness and faith to be like the apostles, to preach your word, to show forth the power of the Spirit through miracles and healing, to be willing to disobey unjust and immoral laws and in, in deference to you and to your higher law, what you are commanding us to do. God, I pray that this would result in joy in our lives, that as we obey you in spirit-fueled obedience, follow you, that you would lay the foundation of joy in our lives in unjust suffering, that when we experience suffering, that we would count it as all joy when we meet trials of various kinds. For we know that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. And I, God, I pray that this steadfastness would have its full effect, that we would be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. I pray this all through Jesus, the name that is above every name. Empower us, Lord, for your service. Amen.